my own family, as uh, George mentioned, uh, a most harrowing experience uh, getting out of Nazi Germany. Um, we were Jews uh, with an alleged Polish background, uh, Polish because my parents were born in something called Austria-Hungary when they were born as little kids that were brought to Germany. Suddenly they were considered Poles because a Poland was recreated after World War I. Um, as, I uh, as I will show you in a minute, uh, th th this, this experience of theirs and my own in, in growing up in Hitler Germany, only Jew in a school, um, we were dumped on the border of Poland one night in scenes that are exactly being replicated on your TV screen today. Uh, 15,000 of us alleged Polish Jews were just dumped on the border, sent off to Poland in 1938. Mother came back to Germany because she was desperately beating on the doors of the U.S. Embassy in Berlin for a visa. She and I got trapped when World War II broke out. We were now not just Jews and Polish Jews, we were enemy aliens in Germany. She had to go up to the uh, police commissioner to try to get permission to leave the country in order to get the American visa. He told her in a most moving thing that I'm glad to record in this book, he said, well, you know, the police don't have any power anymore in this society, it's all the Gestapo. And she said, so where do I go? And he told her the name of the head man of the Gestapo, and then he stopped her on the way out, and he said, you know, you're not supposed to be on the street even that this headquarters is, but if, uh, if you get out, will you tell them that uh, we're not all bad? Um, I felt a need to tell them, because uh, we suffered as, for all the barbarities that we suffered, um, we also suffered individual acts of kindness and, and heroism. Anyway, she went to Gestapo headquarters and in some incredible, with an incredible display of, of wit and, and wicked repartee, she charmed the head man into giving her an exit visa. She and I left on practically the last boat, for Jews anyway. We went through Holland uh, just six weeks before Holland was itself invaded, um, and this was in February 1940 after the war had started. My father, meanwhile, he had stayed in Poland. He didn't want to risk being too long in Germany on the way to America. We got separated, and when the uh, Nazis invaded Poland, he ran the other way, and of course, brother Stalin took the other half of Poland under the uh, Nazi-Soviet pact, and they shipped him off to Siberia uh, on trumped-up charges because they needed labor in those camps, and he chopped trees until he almost fell dead. And then suddenly Poland became an ally of the Soviet Union because Germany attacked, had the bad taste to attack Russia. They released him from the camp, but he had to make his way around Siberia for another five years and didn't finally get out, rejoin the family until 46, late 1946. He came to New York, started the same peddling business uh, that uh, he had started with in Germany. Uh, in West Harlem and finally led to a, a small store. Anyway, I, I want to recount that as a background because this book really became a search of what it is in the nature of journalism and in the nature of the times that I experienced and the, and the great events and some great men that I had the privilege of dealing with, how the, how the roots of that experience uh, uh, shaped me and I think uh, helped alert me to some insights into the nature of, of our media. I, uh, along the way, stumbled into covering Mr. Khrushchev's Russia for three years, Mr. C Castro's Havana for about uh, well, less than a year, uh, the Washington of Kennedy, of Johnson, of Nixon, uh, the Israel of Golda Meir, and Rabin was a good friend. Um, Kit Nixon and Kissinger also took me to China. Uh, where I had the great fortune of uh, putting on a stunt that won a Pulitzer. Um, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the Gulf War, uh, interventions in the Congo, in, in Grenada, in Lebanon, um, Panama, they, they all became my professional uh, concerns. I, I went through in the Army through three atomic explosions out in Nevada that I'll tell you about in a moment, because it again set me up for life. The Bay of Pigs, the Missile Crisis, Pentagon Papers, the Watergate. Finally, revolutions at home. 
uh, an incredible revolution that we've all gone through in the status of women in our society, in the status of blacks, uh, in the status of homosexuals. And finally, now, washing over all of us, a revolution in communication itself, in the nature of the media. I wrote this book chronologically so that I could help myself and the reader uh, find search for the influences on, 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 on that career and on those attitudes that I grew up with. And I will intersperse, if I might, uh, just a few paragraphs occasionally from the book itself. It begins like this. I was not yet three years old when Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933, and I could have become a good little Nazi in his army. I loved the parades. I wept when other kids marched beneath our window without me. But I was ineligible for the Aryan race, the master race that Hitler wanted to purify of Jewish blood and other pollutants so that he could rule the world for a thousand years. A little later on, from the age of memory, I was learning to cope with the world's bizarre delineations of nations and each one's rules and rituals of exit, entry, citizenship, maps, visas, permits, passports were among my toys and lesson plans. I was being trained for refugeedom, primed to be dropped maybe into a Palestinian desert or uh, some Latin American jungle, and I learned not only to distinguish at an early age between lawful and illegal transactions across borders, but also when and where and with whom one could safely discuss such things. In short, I was very well rehearsed for the melodrama of our flight from Hitler, even though our family, as I have explained, botched it in performance. Um, a reign of decrees came, the struggle for a visa for admission to America, the arrests, the deportation to Poland, flight and escape. And then when I came here, a thousand percent American within one month. I told them last night at the stadium that uh, for some reason they handed me one glove uh, on my first week in America, in Brooklyn. I don't know why I didn't get two gloves, but they got this glove and this big grapefruit-sized ball, and ball and bat and bass became my first English words. And then they took me to uh, a public school in Brooklyn, and the principal didn't know what to do with me. I was uh, almost 10, and he gave me a long division problem, and I went to work on it in some bizarre method that he found very amusing. But uh, the answer was right. Um, so he said, okay, you go in the fourth grade, that's where you belong, but every day for an hour and a half you go down to class 1A. And that's where they have, you know, they hold up flashcards, cow, dog, cat, and the chairs are that high. And I was sitting among these midgets uh, <coughs> learning English, and I'll tell you, uh, that is one incentive to graduate back up to the fourth grade. Um, I learned English extremely well and very fast and all the Polish I'd known, I'd gone to school in Poland for nine months, that was gone uh, and the German I refused to speak, my mother insisted because she wanted to keep a language alive for me and my father to communicate in but I wouldn't answer her in German. Turned my back on all these refugees, I wanted to be a thousand percent American, became the boss in the family, told my mother off as to how things really ought to work in this great democracy. A complete inversion of experience and of course wanted to go to school out of the neighborhood at any price. The price was I was going to be an artist so I could go to the music and art high school and get out of the refugee neighborhood that I was stuck in, be with real Americans. Um, and in that school I ran into an incredible teacher, Elsie Herman. I've got a big portrait of her in this book because she called me up in the fifth grade, fifth term, second year. And she said, uh, you're not reading this tale of two cities, are you? I said, uh, sheepishly, no. She said, you're cheating your way through every morning quiz about last night's chapter. You've got these wonderful grades in every other course, and you even write English compositions, not badly, but you don't read. Why not? And I said, well, you know, big words. You've got to look them up five, six times each page. Uh, that's no fun. I don't enjoy it. 
Uh, and frankly, I have no basis. I haven't read much in English, and I'm slow, and it's laborious, and I don't understand what I'm reading. And she said, well, I run the journalism class, and I think if I can get you to write, maybe you will learn to appreciate, to read. And um, your grade here normally would be about 78, 80. And that's not good enough for the journalism class because we take you out of your regular English curriculum. But I will inflate your grade uh, a bit so that you qualify if you promise to knuckle down. Today we call that affirmative action. <coughs> um, I went. Uh, I started sneaking out of art class, out of math class, to run down to the newspaper. This was incredible. I mean, not only was this physically one, one marvelous enterprise, um, but it made me a big shot in the school. I could go to the principal and ask him dumb questions about why he was doing things. Um, I could organize, uh, you know, uh, uh, teams of uh, investigations. I could write a column that was called Globalisms in, you know, in tribute to my childhood fascination with maps and so on. Um, I became editor of that paper, first, for the, the first of three papers I've worked on in my life, all of which I became editor of, um, and um, went on to choose Columbia College, one, because I had a New York State scholarship that paid almost half the fare, but the real reason was it had a daily newspaper. Most of the other colleges I looked at had weeklies or monthlies. And a Columbia Daily Spectator was the attraction. Very incidentally, in keeping with the rest of this silly luck that my family has been blessed with, I happened to stumble into one of the great undergraduate educations available in America uh, with an incredible roster of faculty people um, who taught me why I loved this country. Um, something about the true ideals and the experience most important of which, again, this kid obsessed with borders and tyrannies was one particular book, The Open Society and Its Enemies, which explained all, both fascism and communism and, and why they were, you know, vicious utopias that, that led humanity astray and, and what it is about an open society that was so important, constant self-correction, constant self-examination, and of course the ultimate tribute to what I was all about at that stage in life, that journalism, free discussion, was essential to that process of self-correction. So now I was not only having fun in this great business, suddenly I had a, a cause uh, to live up to. It was also greatly patriotic and important philosophically, and I could sleep well at night. Um, when our family was reunited, another couple of paragraphs from the book. Mom wanted this to be the end of adventure, the end of barriers and boundaries, new languages, homes, and jobs. She had raised a son and reunited a family and conquered a country and outlived Hitler and outfoxed Stalin. And when she thought about things that way, which was not often, it all seemed perfectly logical and inevitable and not remarkable, but tiring. She always weighed her Soros, as she called them in Yiddish, her troubles, on a universal scale and had long since decided that ours belonged on the fortunate side. And that meant she could pity as well as despise her tormentors. Germans, in her mind, were not only the sadists who butchered her mother and uncles and cousins, but also the frightened customers who had risked entering our store in Weissenfels by the back door. Americans were still foreigners to mom. She spoke of them appreciatively but objectively in the third person. They had given her citizenship and a passport, bountiful status and uh, free range, the kind of support she had from her mother and that she'd given to her child. And Americans had saved her child, not only from physical harm but also from statelessness, which counted for almost as much. It was from her son, that mom learned most about Americans, but she had her own firm convictions about them. Although they pushed you horribly in the subway, cheated you at the butchers, and let their children behave like wild Indians, and although they were innocent of most of the pain in the world, Americans produced 
diverting movies, handy kitchen gadgets, gave work to anyone unafraid of exertion, let a Jew be a Jew, and felt an obligation to help a woman to reunite with her husband. All that Americans demanded in return was that you not look too poor or wretched, that you not play the beggar or refugee or otherwise remind them of their debt to the world and the world that enriched them, the war that enriched them. This nation of businessmen had no stomach for philosophical accounts. People who make them feel proud to be Americans are the people Americans like the best, and they liked mom a lot. <laughs> then came father, and we had to try to reunite this family, and I was the boss, and he wanted to be the boss, and he wanted mom to quit working. She'd made herself a fur finisher for seven bucks a week at the beginning. Um, she'd learned this career, and no, he was hell-bent to start being the patriarch of the family again. Over my objections, another quote, the old nightgowns and socks and brassieres were stored in floor-to-ceiling metal shelving in my room. Each morning long before I rose for school, Pop played solitaire with his account cards on the kitchen table, mapping a promising route for the day. Everyone asked why he wasn't afraid to carry money so conspicuously around Harlem. What was there to be afraid of, he wanted to know. Well, the questioner wasn't prejudiced, but you know, uh, Harlem's a dangerous place. Not to Pop, he was still colorblind. All that Pop knew about Negroes was that they were dark-skinned working people and just as loyal as his best customers in Germany, he would insist. They offered him cool drinks on hot days, shared family confidences, pointed him toward new customers, and so before the women of Harlem went to work in the morning, and long after they came home in the evening, Pop would chug through the littered streets in his chauffeur-driven Chevy, dispensing lollipops and balloons to the crowds of kids who celebrated his arrival. He was now 45 years old. He charged up and down six-story walk-ups with his heavy suitcases. He collected debts or tales of woe about lost jobs, missing husbands. Within just six months, the route supported both Pop and the chauffeur. And within a year, Pop learned to drive himself. Years later, after he'd collapsed from exhaustion a couple of times, the customers he'd shrewdly chosen went right on paying their debts to his wife and son. And years later, after Pop had been beaten up and robbed on a dimly lit stair, and as in Germany, moved his whole operation into a small store on Amsterdam Avenue, the same customers, they still came by bus if necessary to pay off their accounts and incur new debts. A blow to the head in yet another robbery in the store finally finished the store but in the 60s, but to Pop's amazement, the mail continued to bring in dollar bills to pay down almost all of the outstanding debt. He retired with profound respect for his customers, the people who restored his authority as a provider, husband and father, and left him with a satisfying sense of opportunity in America. Uh, in Colombia, besides learning in the morning, no courses after 12, because then I had to go to the spectator and be a reporter, and then starting in sophomore year, I lucked into a job covering Columbia. We had Eisenhower as president and all kinds of educational news for the New York Times. And whether I had a story or not, every afternoon toward the evening, I'd head down to the New York Times and peer over the shoulders of the great ones uh, as they put their wonderful stories to bed and learned everything I could and was determined never to take my foot out of that door uh, and get a job, which I did after graduation. I had to monkey around with the draft board a bit during the Korean War to make sure I worked one year at the Times before I went in the Army so that they'd be forced to take me back. Um, went into the Army and had the great distinctive rank, really distinctive, private in the Pentagon. Uh, there were very few of us um, with that rank. Um, and I had the great distinction of being the uh, after hours correspondent of Stars and Stripes with an open line to Tokyo. And I could send messages where colonels had to put them into code and, and wait a long time to get response to their golf dates and the other things they were arranging for Tokyo. <laughs> Uh, I gave instant, instant service on my private communications line. Um, I also could have sunk the army single-handedly because they had extended a privilege to me 
of only seven weeks of basic training, which they refused to give to a fellow named G. David Shine, who was Roy Cohn's con um, sidekick, and as a result of which, uh, Roy Cohn and McCarthy started the whole brawl with the army because they were so offended. Um, and I could have gone across town and said to McCarthy, these guys are lying to you. They did for me what they're refusing to do to, for Shine. Anyway, long story short, the end of my career in the Army, they sent me out to the Nevada desert. I was corporal by then to go through three explosions of atomic weapons. And the reason was that the Army wanted to prove to the world, and especially to Congress and the budget makers in Congress, that uh, it was safe to use nuclear weapons in tactical situations. So we, they put us troops a thousand, into trenches a thousand yards away from where they exploded the bomb, and the minute it exploded, we get up out of the trenches and we maneuver as we would in a battle across what is called ground zero. Uh, the civil defense operation in the next piece of the desert had built these paper houses because they wanted to prove the opposite, that uh, you know cities would go up in flames instantly and how dangerous this weapon was. And the Air Force was doing its thing over there and the Marine Corps here. The Atomic Energy Commission got so fed up with these rival press releases that they said, from now on, everything is top secret. So Corporal Frankel, now Corporal, was asked whether he had a civilian suit. Um, in the Pentagon, I said, yes, sir, and he said, well, report to Nevada Desert Proving Grounds, uh, Camp Desert Rock, and when I got out there, they said my job was to go into the trenches, go through this stuff three times, and then every night after each explosion, drive in my civilian clothes to Las Vegas casinos, find the New York Times correspondent whom I knew well, and the other reporters, and leak the atomic secrets uh, <coughs> so that the army side of the story would be properly told and recounted in the press. This is where I developed my great uh, passion for top secret information, uh, <coughs> culminating in the great case of the Pentagon Papers, which I was privileged to fight. Um, I'm running very short on time, over the time that uh, George has allotted me, and let me just say I went on by one fluke to another to inherit at a very young age, right after I got back to the Times, to our version, our era's Titanic, the sinking of the Andrea Doria. I was the youngest reporter in the room when the SOS came in over our own radio and somebody asked me to check it out, and the next thing you know I'm writing this heroic story seven times during the night. Um, that finally erased the image of the Columbia kid at the New York Times and then they sent me out on political errands over to Hungary, to up Vienna to cover the Hungarian Revolution because I spoke German and because they didn't know I was married they thought that it would be cheaper to send one rather than two. They had to send two. While we were over there, luck would have it, uh, one of the two Times correspondents in Russia got thrown out. They tried to get every expert and Russian speaker on the staff in, Harrison Salisbury, Mike Handel, a lot of famous names. Re Russians rejected them all while preserving the principle that we could have another correspondent. They finally said, you're this neuter. You don't know a word of Russian. Uh, they can't possibly have anything in the KGB files. You try it. And within one week, I had a visa and stumbled into this incredible story. Uh, again, as a young kid, uh, a life-shaping experience, really, in understanding a, 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 the Cold War through Russian eyes and coming face to face two, three times a week with Khrushchev, who was determined to show a new face to the world and uh, to prepare me later on for encounters with uh, Castro and with seeing the Cold War then from ultimately for 12 years from the Washington end of things, um, where of course uh, Khrushchev engaged Kennedy. Um, first we were humiliated at the Bay of Pigs, then we went through the missile crisis, um, posing great issues, really, of how much information we had a right to publish uh, when occasionally the president would ask us to withhold. Uh, we did that on one very important occasion in the, in the missile crisis, another lesson in, in the, the role that the me sensitive role that the media had to play here. Went on to cover Johnson's White House, just in time to see the end of the great society and the beginning of the tragedy in Vietnam and to see this giant man um, fall, tragically. Uh, all the while, 
uh, my first wife, my late wife, uh, who had been my, my eyes and ears in Russia because she learned Russian faster than I and she could make friends whereas I was the enemy spy. Um, she learned about Russian life, but we came home and our lives began to drift apart because she was an educated woman suddenly with two-year-olds, as she put it. Um, she bore in herself all the tensions that I later learned to respect in the feminist movement in this country, learned about it right at home firsthand. And then horror of horrors learned also about what manic depression can do to a person because on top of all her other problems, uh, Toby, uh, defining her career, she developed a deep depression. Uh, and it took us a lifetime in our ignorance to learn and for her to accept the idea that there could be help. And when she finally found drugs um, that changed her personality back to her youthful spirit almost overnight, a matter of six weeks actually, um, we remarkably came together again and she finally wound up in law school and she'd lined up um, working for a judge after graduation and she got brain cancer and died. Um, and um, luck of lux, not long after, I fell in love yet again uh, with a marvelous woman who bathed me in the kind of love my mother had gotten me used to. Um, she is now the first woman metropolitan editor of the New York Times. Not my doing. She was taken out of my jurisdiction when I was the editor. Um, but as soon as I left, uh, she began to soar. Anyway, uh, it's been a life that really made for three books, you know, Escape uh, and Assimilation in this country, a, a small history of the, my whole reporting career amounting to a history of the Cold War, and then finally 20 years in various posts managing this great institution, which if it didn't exist and couldn't be perpetuated profitably, uh, I think would never be recreated and setting standards for all of journalism that I hope uh, uh, we made a contribution to. But it's three books in a different sense. It's a, it's a love story. Uh, it's a love story for mom, an incredible character. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a love um, for this country and all that I said it meant to me. And it's a love for journalism and particularly the times and the family that uh, is setting those standards. And so I insisted on forcing these three books together under one set of hard covers. And uh, I hope those of you uh, who are moved uh, to look at it uh, will enjoy it. Thank you so much.